Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have today our guest, Naz, that will um, uh, present on um, uh, Ramadan traditions and facts, uh, but also she will share with you um, a PowerPoint um, that is made of photos that she took when she had a, a trip to the two holy sites. Cities in Saudi Arabia. And she will talk about this. Uh, there is going to be time for questions and answers. So after the presentation, um, about in 15 minutes, I will serve soup and bread, uh, lentil soup and bread. And then after that, uh, we're going to go on to the uh, uh, photo um, slideshow. And uh, I just want to mention to you that on the tables, you find the dates um, courtesy of, um, of NAS. Uh, some dates are just plain, the others are with almonds. So just so you know, in case you don't do nuts. We have some water and uh, uh, iced tea. If you uh, would like, please. And like I said, after the presentation, I will serve soup. So um, it's all yours. If you want to introduce yourself. It's all mine. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to begin with a prayer, which is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which I begin in the name of God, the most compassionate and most merciful. Thank you for inviting me here. This is wonderful. Um, greetings of peace. I'm, I'm going to read because if I don't read, my senior brain will go all over the place. <laughs> all right. Thank you for inviting me again to share my faith and how we practice Ramadan in our daily lives. I'm going to briefly share about Ramadan, which is starting this weekend. And then we will share a slideshow of my recent visit to our two holy cities in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia. I begin with what God in our holy book, the Quran, commands. O ye who believe, fasting is prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you, that ye may learn self-restraint. Ramadan is the month in which was sent down the Quran as a guide to mankind. Also clear signs for guidance and judgment between right and wrong. And whosoever of you is present, let him fast the month. And whosoever of you is sick or on a journey, let him fast the same number of other days. Allah desired for you ease. He desired not hardship for you. And he desired that ye sh should complete the period and that ye should magnify Allah for having guided you, and that ye may be thankful. Chapter 2, verses 180, 183 to 185. God Almighty further goes on to say, Allah does not place a burden upon a person except that which he is capable. I'm going to interchange between God and Allah, because Allah is the Arabic word for the universal God. So I will be going back and forth. Fasting in the month of Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam and one of the highest forms of worship. Muslims fast during this holy month from the break of dawn until sunset. Fasting is an act of faith and worship towards Allah, seeking to suppress our base desires and increase our spiritual piety. Fasting together as a worldwide community affirms the brotherhood and equality of humankind before Allah. We Muslims have to change our whole physical and emotional selves during this month. Abstinence from earthly pleasures and curbing negative intentions and base desires is regarded as an act of obedience and submission to God, as well as an atonement for past sins, errors, and mistakes. Besides the physical component and fasting of the senses, the spiritual aspects of the fast include refraining from gossip, lying, slandering in all traits of bad character. All obscene and irreligious sights and sounds are to be avoided. Purity of thought and action is paramount. Ordained in the Quran, the fast is an exact exacting act of deeply personal worship in which Muslim seeks 
a high raised level of God consciousness. The internal and, in, and external acts of fasting redirects the hearts away from worldly activities towards the divine. Can everybody hear me? Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. It begins with the sighting of the new moon after which all physically mature and healthy Muslims are obliged to abstain from food, drink, chewing gum, any kind of tobacco use, and spousal intimacy between dawn and sunset. The lunar month changes, so each year Ramadan arrives early. So in about 35 years, Ramadan has gone through four seasons. The month of Ramadan is a time for personal spiritual reflection, prayers, doing good deeds, and spending time with family and friends. The fasting is intended to help teach us Muslims self-discipline, self-restraint, and generosity. It also reminds us of the suffering of the poor who may really get to eat well, and we all know about food insecurity in our own country and, and <coughs> worldwide. It teaches one to experience the sufferings of the less fortunate. Muslims believe that fasting leads one to appreciate the bounties of Allah, which are taken usually for granted until they are missed. To a Muslim, fasting not only means from abstaining from food, but it also refraining from all vice and evils committed consciously and unconsciously. It is believed that if one volunteers to refrain from lawful foods and intimacy in this month, we will be in a better position to avoid unlawful things and acts during the rest of the year. This month is like a spiritual boot camp. We eat a small meal just before dawn and the next time we eat, to end the day's fast is at sunset, which commonly consists of dates, water, and traditional beverage. And then we say our sunset prayers, followed by a nutritious meal, and then stand for special nighttime prayers at the local mosque or at home. Since Ramadan is a time to spend with family and community, the fast will often be broken by families coming together at homes or joining the mosque or a community if that, which is the break of the fast meal. Throughout the month, Muslims are encouraged to go out of their way to help the needy, both financially and emotionally. Some believe that a, re that a reward earned during this month, this month is multiplied 70 times and more. For this reason, Ramadan is also known as the month of charity and generosity. Ramadan derives from the Arabic root word Ramida or al ramad meaning scorching heat or dryness. Since Muslims are commanded to fast during Ramadan, it is believed that the month's name may refer to the thirst, to the heat of thirst and hunger, or because fasting burns away one's sin. Muslims believe that God began reading the Quran to our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during Ramadan in the year C 610 CE. Fasting during Ramadan did not become an obligation for Muslims until later, at which point it became the third of the five pillars of Islam. Another aspect of Ramadan is that it is believed that one of the last few odd-numbered nights of the, month, of the month is the night of power. It is the holiest night of the holiest month. It is believed to be the night in which God began revealing to revealing the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through the Archangel Gabriel. This is a time for specially fervent and devoted prayers and supplications, and the rewards and blessings associated with such are manifold. Muslims are told in the Quran that praying throughout this one night is better than a thousand months of prayer. No one knows exactly which night it is. It is one of God's mysteries. Additionally, Muslims are urged to read the entire Quran during this month, and its 114 chapters have been divided into 30 equal parts for this purpose. 
Before the end of Ramadan, Muslims give charity in a prescribed amount calculated to feed one poor person in the local uh, region for one day. This is known as a al fitr and is meant as another reminder of the suffering endured by many. Many Muslims also take this month to pay the annual alms which are due to the poor and needy known as a khat, another pillar of Islam. After the 30 days of fasting, the end of Ramadan observed with the day of celebration called Eid al-Fitr. On this day, Muslims gather in one place to offer a prayer of thanks. It is traditional to wear new clothes, visit friends and relatives, exchange gifts, eat delicious dishes prepared for that occasion, and then wait patiently for the next Ramadan. At the beginning of Ramadan, it is appropriate to wish Muslims Ramadan Mubarak, which means blessed Ramadan. At its conclusion, you may say Eid Mubarak. Thank you for your attention. And um, as Violet said, we have dates on the table for you. And the significance of dates is that um, in Medina, which is the city of our Holy Prophet, the only fruits of that time and still is our dates. So you see multiple date orchards all over, uh, all over the city and the surrounding area. And dates is supposed to has been mentioned even in the Quran, just like others have been mentioned. And it has got a lot of nutritional properties. And we break the fast with dates is because that's how our prophet Peace be upon him. Broke his day, uh, broke his fast. So, and part of our uh, Muslim tradition is to follow the uh, in the footsteps of the Prophet, which is called the Sunnah or the traditions. So now I'm open for questions. Answer. Well, maybe the question and answer would be a good time now. I'm prepping the the bread toast, and uh, we're gonna serve soup. Um. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Did I go too fast? No, 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 that's okay. But I, I, that's your chance now to ask questions before we go to the slideshow yes. after the soup. So please, uh, Naz, it's all yours to ask questions. Yes. Okay, so yes. the Ramadan starts on um, Friday? or It starts, as I said, it's on, based on the lunar calendar. And we have two, two thinkings. One, uh, one uh, thought is to follow the calculated sighting of the, you know, sighting of the moon of the lunar calendar, and the other is physically seeing the new crescent. And the new, and so it depends on what, you know, what the, uh, uh, the majority in your land does. So we, being, uh, you being here, we follow what our main mosque in Springfield does. They follow the actual sighting. And the actual sighting will be anywhere in North America. So sometimes, we don't know if Ramadan starts till about pretty late after sunset. So, so the hope is that it will be either on Saturday or Sunday. And the lunar calendar sort of fluctuates between 29 and 30 days. So there's some predict predictability, but but not total. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you shared that you, the uh, Quran is broken into the 30 parts to be read during. On average, how much time each day would it take to read each part? It depends on how uh, versatile you are, or how uh, sort of um, uh, what was the familiar you are with the, with the Quran. There have been I mean, there have been people who read the entire Quran in a day. It's you know, it's Arabic, and personally, I try and do one one section at a, at a, a day. We, and basically, we've been recommended that you know, we have five kind of prayers. So if you do about four to five pages at each of the five prayers, then we can do one chapter, one chapter, uh, or one section complete, and then you sort of progress throughout, throughout to the end of the, end of the month. And then the special nighttime prayers, which is called Karabi, which is only done during Ramadan, 
the, uh, we have a reciter who is uh, a hafiz. A hafiz is one who has memorized the entire Quran. So he leads the prayers and the community just follows. So in that way we also complete another, another whole uh, uh, section of the Quran. Yes. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. You mentioned the word God consciousness a little earlier. Mm -hmm. And it struck a chord in my heart. Could you talk about the path of the Muslim in terms of the interior path, in terms of the going within, in terms of meditation, mm -hmm. in terms of surrendering to God, Correct. in terms of being non judgmental, and in essence, to love in words and deeds. Correct. Can you go into some detail on all of that if you would? Because I don't think I'll have another opportunity to be here with you and really explore how does the Muslim really work that spiritual life within? Because the whole trip primarily is within, although we serve the others without. Thank you. And you have you seen this center it writes me again? You may see me again here. Um, we have two paths that Muslims are supposed to uh, follow in their, uh, in their journey in this world. And this world, according to the uh, Islamic theology, is a transient world. We are born, we stay here a certain period of time, and after that is our eternal life. And I can only talk about my personal journey. The personal journey to internalization and spiritual uh, God consciousness began with just acquiring knowledge. That, that, is, that is what I have found has, been, has made me, me understand my, my uh, religion, understand the qualities of God, understand how, uh, you know, how we practice and, and internalize it. And if you read the Quran in translation, then you will know that each, each word, which is the direct word of God, has multiple meanings. And so we, we, you know, uh, we attend a lot of lectures, we've got a lot of scholars who give you that guidance. And um, so that is basically where you start your internal journey. And the external is the, you know, the, the prayers, and what you do the, as uh, as commanded, but the uh, but God consciousness is something that comes through just meditation and contemplation, looking at nature, just being very observant. And after a while, how it has helped me is I use a criteria to uh, you know to move forward in my life and making decisions. I said, you know, is this pleasing to God? Is this something that will benefit me? Is this harmful? Is it beneficial? So you always are constantly uh, uh, weighing the uh, weighing the, uh, the two sides, and constant, constantly being thankful and gratitude for what you receive. It's you know a scholar will be able to give you a much better um, you know, explanation, but this is how I have uh, developed thought consciousness and just being aware and. And over time, I realized how much it has eased me in, um, in my stress or eased me knowing that I do my best and the ultimate is in God's hand. You know, he is the provider. He is the sustainer. And that's what helps you. So it, it, it alleviates that stress that we think we have control over our lives, but we don't. And it just, for example, you know, like I had to leave my mother who was, you know, who was not well, and I had to leave for an emergency. And I just remember very poignantly leaving the house, saying, "God, I'm leaving mom in your care." And that's how, you know, that's how you sort of internalize the understanding and start becoming aware of um, God on a daily and you know, minute-to-minute -minute basis. Did that answer your question? It's a beautiful beginning. Thank you. Yes, thank Would you. you like to share soup with us? Um, sure. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I have to go clean up.
Uh, to uh, so um, it's a vegetarian soup. It's a base on vegetables and olive oil uh, and uh, and the bread and dates. Would you mind to share the significance of the dates and the lentil soup? Dates, I think I did because okay. it is something that is you know very much to, uh, described as a nutritional you know, sort of fruit. Yeah. And lentil soup is. Um, Lentil is protein. But I, I bread, that's why I made it. I mean, you know, it's a really nutritious uh, for the whole day of fasting. It's a nutritious uh, meal you can have after. Yes, yes. And it's because you know the whole point of fasting is not overeating. It is you know uh, uh, bring it to the discipline yourself to uh, to uh, uh, to not overindulge. And fasting is also. Of the senses, you know, we uh, we abstain from food and we abstain from drinks and you know lawful uh, uh, intimacy, but we also fast of our senses. So we try not to look at um, you know at things that are not recommended that are you know that we've been told to curtail our social media and the phone sort of time that we spend uh, during these times. You know, then you, don't, you try not to hear anything other than what is pleasing. Like, you know, we do a lot of uh, recitation of the Quran and we, you know, we recite it ourselves. So you're hearing it. And then, um, you, you know, your, your, your tongue, you're supposed to not get into any arguments. You know, we are recommended that if there is any altercation, just say that, you know, you're unfasting. So you're reminding yourself not to respond. Reminding yourself not to get sort of sucked in into, into something that is taking you away from your spiritual pursuit. And then also walking. You know, if you you know if you're driving traditionally you would walk to the mosque. So every step you take to the mosque is a blessing, is a reward. So you know, so those so those are so you're also doing it, you know, your your limbs are also supposed to be fasting along with uh, you know, hunger and uh, and uh, prayers. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if I misunderstood, but I thought that the intention was to not enjoy pleasures. Is that correct? Or did I misunderstand that? No, it's not not to enjoy pleasures because God has created this world for our benefit. It is to our benefit, but not to forget who we should be grateful for. So not to abuse it, not to misuse it. You know, like, uh, you know, like, I mean, what what's happening with the, uh, you know, the pollution that we will be responsible to answer on the day of judgment? What did you do? I mean, if this was the situation, what did you do? So, so it's not to because there is no renouncing the world. Like, there's no sort of you know, going into a convent or or any of that those practices, but. You are. It's a. It's the challenge is trying to balance the world, the you know, the worldly life with your spiritual life. So, so oh yes. I mean, you know, if you go, you're not going to be if you do not uh, appreciate God's creation, then you are not appreciating Him in His entirety. And I use the word Him. It's because God is sexless. I mean, that's the way God referred to Him Himself in the Quran. So, so it's, it doesn't have any uh, sort of sexual um, gender identity. Yeah. I'm going to give a uh, nice break so she can enjoy the soup. Please enjoy your soup. If you have any questions, we're going to continue in a moment. I just have asked. I'm just putting it all together. My friend is just putting it all together. I'm pretty uh, technology challenged. Thank you for my neighbor friend. <laughs> so, I was very blessed to go to our holy city in Mecca and Medina and uh, in Saudi Arabia. And the reason why, uh, you know, one of the five pillars of Islam is to go for Hajj. And Hajj is in the, the last month of our lunar calendar. So Ramadan is in April, May, June, End of June, early July would be the month of uh, Hajj. And at that season, we Muslims from all over the world 
go for pilgrimage to our holy cities. And that's called the Hajj, which is one of the five pillars. But in the off-season, outside of the month of Hajj, we do exactly the same, except a few rituals, which is called the Umrah. And that's what I did to, uh, to Mecca and Medina, throughout, uh, you know, throughout from New York City. And it when was, did you go? I went in um, November. Just this year? Yeah, just, just a few months ago. December? Oh yes, that's right. That's right. It was it was towards the end of December. Yes, yes. Does it not count as a hajj if you don't go during that month when everybody goes for hajj? It did, no, it does not count as hajj because it has to be in that month and because it has some very specific rituals, which is based on you know on Abraham and Adam and Eve and those kinds of uh, those rituals that we have to follow. But for Umrah, we, uh, we do exactly the same, go to the two cities, we do all the, uh, the circumambulation and the supplication, but we then don't go to Arafat, which is uh, called the Mount of Mercy, which is, which is actually the Hajj day. And at that location, the belief is that when Adam and Eve were you know, sent down to earth, that's where they met. So that's why it's called the Mount of Mercy. And at that same location, our prophet, in his last year, gave his final sermon, summarizing the uh, religion. So it has that significance. And that also, in the same area, you have you know, when Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son, Ishmael. So it's also located in that geographical area. And going backwards, the Kaaba, which is our holy sit, the holy shrine, is the house of God from time began. And the belief is that a meteorite fell from the heavens on that spot. And then uh, Adam, Adam was asked to start uh, the first sort of symbol of God structure there. And then Abraham and his son rebuilt it. And then it has gone through multiple sort of uh, rebuilding. But that square that you see, and you will see on my slide, oh, you see it right there. That is the Kaaba. And we face the, the direction of Kaaba for prayers. So, okay, all right. So this is um, my trip. On the top is the Kaaba, which is the house of God in Mecca. Then the second with the green dome is the, uh, the Prophet's Mosque, which is in, the, uh, which is in Medina. So, that, so these are the two holy, holy sites in, uh, in Islam. And the third holy site is Jerusalem for us. So these are the three holy sites that we are recommended to visit if we can. And the other, the way you see me is one of the gates. And it's just beautiful gates. And, the gates to the mosque of the, of the Prophet is named after his, um, his first round of companions, four compa main companions that he had, and then, and then the periphery. So there are multiple gates uh, uh, to enter into the mosque. So, all right, here I go. All right, so this is the, the international airport in Jadda that he arrived. I just found the, the ceilings very fascinating, as you will see in the next slide. So this is how you 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 know you see the ceiling of the uh, the, uh, the airport in Jeddah, the international airport in Jeddah. So what we did was we flew from JFK into Jeddah, and then so this is my first um, uh, arrival, and this is going to then we flew to Medina where the city of the prophet and you know you can see how how rugged the the terrain is and i just found the the sky so beautiful and the outline of the the mountains just spectacular it's just rugged in its uh, and, yeah, beautiful in its bareness wow. so this is entering into the city 
where you know you see the you, towards the end of uh, the road you see the uh, uh, the, the prophet's mosque. So this was my first uh, glimpse of the mosque entering the city. And this is a graveyard going back to the time of the prophet. Peace be upon him. And this is where um, it's, uh, you know, they, there are about thousands of uh, crazy sites. Very simple, they just amount with a headstone on the, on the, for the head, you know, a stone on the head. It's as simple as that. And it is still being used. So believe you me, for every prayer, we do five time prayers and I would say ten days. Other than one prayer, we, every prayer had a prayer funeral. Funeral for the dead. So, you know, people who are there as pilgrims are locals who die and they think, and then you, you, you go to the mosque, you, you know, the body is taken to the mosque and we have a special uh, funeral prayer. And then, if you're so lucky, this space, then you go directly into this uh, special enclosed cemetery for burial. So, you know, this is going back 1400 years. That's how, that's how old this uh, gravesite is. And it's called Genital Bucky, Paradise on Earth. That's what it's called. Alright, so this is the hotel and the first glimpse of the entirety of the Mosque of the Prophet from, our, from the lobby. I thought that was just wonderful. So, please stop me if you have questions. All right, so this is the courtyard of the mosque, and these are umbrellas. These are umbrellas that are, that's there to protect you from the sun, because in the summer it is scorching hot. So these are there to protect you uh, in the summer, and it is just amazing, you know, how beautiful it is that you see. You know, in the second slide you can see the tip of the minaret, and you see other wonderful sights. All right, so this is a clearer view of the minaret between the, uh, the, uh, the umbrellas and, um, I'm sorry, the other slide is a little too elongated. All right, so this is another view of the mosque, of uh, the mosque of the Prophet. And you see the green barriers, so for every prayer time, they cordon off certain areas for people to pray outside. So, with each prayer, you could have at least about 10,000 people. Luckily, because of COVID, it was restricted, so we really lucked out. Because, uh, so with the crowd control, because they controlled the... Uh, so for every time we had to go into the compound of the mosque, we had to show a uh, permit. That's how they did crowd control. They had to show a permit to, for an appointment for prayers as well as your COVID uh, certificate. So it felt very safe. So this, these are uh, these are the two mosques uh, surrounding the um, the main mosque of the Prophet. Uh, this mosque is considered to be where the Prophet made special supplications and prayers for rain. And the story goes is that as he was supplicating to God for rain people saw this cloud sort of coming closer and closer and closer and stopped right above him and then he pointed to, diff to the different areas that there was no water. So, so that's, that's the, uh, uh, yeah, the story behind it. So it is, it is now considered, you know, used as a, as a regular prayer space. And, and the pigeons galore. <laughs> Pigeons, 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 and they, and they, uh, so you see on the top, you see the interior of the cemetery. See how simple it is. And then at the bottom, you have there, there's a cat, who's you know, the cat of the cemetery. So Haley, you see, uh, you see the palm tree? Yes. Yeah, next to the person in the in the blue, that is what a date palm tree looks like. Oh, okay. All right, here's another cat. 
And so this is um, looking out. You see just the perspective of um, of the uh, umbrella umbrellas. And these umbrellas, the top pillars that you're seeing, the umbrellas have shut down. And in one of the in one of the uh, uh, slides you will see sort of closing down into so at night time they uh, they close themselves and at, uh, at morning they open up. There's so that's a door and it's all gold leaf with calligraphy and it's just you know it's just an amazing uh, visual. Oops. All right. I need you here. <laughs> this is a um, a slide. All right, just you know what? I just just go there. Yeah. So this is this is inside of the mosque, and um, you see the sky. The sky is always covered with a a movable a movable ceiling. And I'm not sure if the slide would work, but I was praying, and then suddenly I heard this sort of you know, sound behind me, and I looked up, and the whole ceiling was shifting, and it opened up to reveal the um, the daytime sky. So this is another scene uh, of prayers. And this is the interior of the mosque of the Prophet. So this is night time. We are walking through the downtown of Medina towards a the mosque where the, the was which is considered to be the first um, landing of our prophet when he walked through the desert from Mecca to Medina, and that is when we start calculating our uh, Islamic calendar. Another view of uh, the mosque. All right. This is the morning view. view. I went for my uh, you know, my uh, daybreak uh, uh, prayer, and I looked up, and this is what I saw behind me through the uh, through the umbrellas. And that's another uh, view of the uh, interior of the mosque. This is nighttime. All right, this was most fascinating. That is how they did maintenance of these umbrellas. You have these tall ladders, and you see the two spots under the bucket? That's somebody's footsteps. So that's how they did the cleaning. And then on the other one, they, that's how they cleaned all the, um, uh, the lights under the umbrellas. You know, modern technology was amazing there, how well they used it. So this... We are coming out from, uh, from inside the Prophet's mosque, visiting his grave site. So, which is, and the mosque is built where he originally built his first uh, uh, mosque, as well as his, his um, the houses that he lived in. So, that is where the, uh, the, the location of the mosque is today. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I apologize, I don't want to offend anybody. I know very little of, um, of um, the religion and traditions. And is anybody who is not Muslim allowed to visit those sites? Just like in the Vatican, non-Christians are not allowed, Muslims are not. Because it's sacred. But you can, is, you know, you can go to the periphery, but not within the parameters. And so that's how they clean. So what was interesting is that you know you pray, and then there'll be these uh, crews of cleaners that will come and you know use those green um, uh, fence, uh, 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 fences or whatever you may call it, and then they would just move around the entire. Uh, uh, courtyard of the mosque cleaning, so they would do cleaning section by section, and that's how they managed to keep it clean. So this is the most sacred part of the mosque because the green dome is right above where our prophet is buried. So his grave site 
plus two of his favorite companions are, are in, inside the mosque. And this is the interior of the mosque that we went to see. So it's just gorgeous, it's just amazing. Um, there's not a single surface that isn't uh, decorated. So you see that uh, uh, the round dial, that is the ceiling that, was, that would open up to, uh, to uh, he opened up to the sky that you saw in the in a slide before. All right, this is the view from my balcony in the hotel. So the first one, looking up, you can see that little uh, contraption doing the uh, cleaning of uh, the windows. And if you look at this, the, uh, on the other side is looking down to the uh, entrance. Oh, wow. And you see the escalators going down. So th this was the first floor of the hotel. I mean, it was just fascinating. And then in, uh, this is in Medina, in Makkah, I was on the 16th floor, which felt really strange. All right, so this is one of the wells from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So after we went to sit, our nighttime excursion, we went to this orchard where this uh, well is still functioning. And they were at his time, there were seven of these wells, and they are still fu functioning and providing water to the city. What is that saying, Jalil Salam, which is the Arabic for peace be upon him. So this is the, uh, the water filling up. And then these are the historic sites when, um, you know, while he was, while the Prophet was there, he fought a few battles and these are the sites of the different battles. And that was, uh, that were being fought, which is now turned in, the sites have been turned into mosques and people go for, uh, they, they use for prayers as well as uh, part of sightseeing. This is our team, our group that went here, that went for Umrah, and the gentleman in the brown was our scholar. He was the, he was the uh, our sheikh, the leader. So along with doing the rituals, we also had um, uh, lectures, and he was our uh, scholar at that time. So sheikh. Sheikh. Yeah. Sheikh. Was a leader, could be referred to as a sheikh. A sheikh. Sheikh is a term of uh, respect. So this is um, uh, just uh, you know different mosques that have significance. This was um, this mosque represents the location of where the sentries during the battles did their prayer. So they just made this as a, as a holy site where people would go and visit and and pray currently. So these are different, uh, you know, different, that's another uh, mosque and different uh, landscape. I just found that very interesting, especially the, the border on the top of the house. The, the architecture was very interesting. So this is on the way to another uh, site. In between the tree, you see palm trees. You see palm trees at the other end. That's, uh, those are all date orchards. So this is another one of the uh, significant uh, sites, uh, battle sites. Right, so now we are go traveling from uh, from Medina to Mecca, and it's it's a, it's a fast train. The, the the travel time by car is about five and a half hours, but by train, this bullet train was only two hours. So it was it was amazing. And unfortunately, we traveled at night, so I couldn't really see the uh, the landscape as much as I would have liked. So how fast were you going? Like 150 miles an hour? It's like those bullet trains of Japan. You know, it's just amazing. I know. I you you know, but it's very comfortable, and you know, just the fact that we were able to, you know, travel the distance so fast in such comfort that you know, didn't even think about anything else, because you know, the, because on the way. You have to make your intention because we're going towards the Makkah now, and we're going to do our Umrah, which is the actual the ritual that we are, we have uh, committed ourselves to do. So on the way, you've got to make that intention, and 
And men have uh, special garb that they're supposed to wear into, and women wear the same clothes that we do. So, so, is so, you know, and then uh, um, you repeat the call of Prophet Abraham when he was making the, the Kaaba, the house of God. He supplicated to God, you know, let my uh, the generations to come after me uh, be in, in obedience to you and to, to believe in you as the one true God. So we supplicate that yes, we are uh, responding to that call. So you so you chant that on the way to uh, that's part of the rituals. So this is my first sight of the Kaaba. And uh, that was the entrance, and this is the Kaaba. It was amazing how close we could get to it because of COVID. Otherwise, it would be, you know, you would just not be able to get that close. It was, you know, where the fence, you see the fence, we were on the other side of the fence, and, uh, and it was just awe-inspiring to have to be, to be able to, you know, be in the presence of this, immense um, sort of uh, you know, spiritual um, symbol that we revere and pray towards every, you know, five times a day. That's another one. We have just finished our Umrah, which is the ritual. Which is, Umrah is, means that we do seven circuits counterclockwise around the, um, the black stone. So that's part of uh, the ritual. And then the second part of the ritual is going towards the, towards the end. You see the, the yellow sort of arches. Above that is something called Safa and Marwa. Those are the two sort of hillocks that um, was Hajj Hagar, when she was left uh, with her son Ishmael, in that barren land, she ran from the two mounds in search of water for her baby son because you know they were they were just left with a little bit of water, and and the belief is that on the seventh circuit she saw Gabriel um, near her son and a, and a, and a water uh, gushing out, a spring gushing out, and it is still. Um, in existence, it's still pumping out water. That's called the well of Zamza, and that's where you know we. That's our like considered uh, holy water with a lot of uh, healing properties. So part of the ritual is to drink um, the, the Zamza water. So this is the uh, the the uh, outside of Medina, and. Um, this is the shopping area, and uh, Makkah. I'm sorry, Makkah uh, uh, traditionally was a commercial center, so it still has that hustle and bustle of uh, of business. Versus Medina, which is uh, where he uh, migrated to, is a very tranquil and very peaceful, uh, you know, sort of feeling. I mean, when I arrived there, I. Said, I I want to go back to Medina. I don't, you know, this is too busy for me. But then, you know, then you just get uh, caught up with the ritual and the allness of the, uh, the, the space there. So one, two, the second tall one was uh, was uh, our hotel on the 16th floor. And you see the number six. Uh, that that structure is where the uh, the bathrooms are scattered all over for men and women to do their uh, ablution and uh, the use the restroom. And on the other side is just a scene. Here, yeah, I just found it fascinating how they build their homes on these rugged mountains. Yeah, another site. Yeah. And there's constant, you know, you see these minerals and then you see the cranes of construction because they're forever expanding. Uh, can I ask you, what are those fans there for? Pardon? The fans. Oh, they have the fans running 24-7 because to circulate the air, because of the heat. They have that on all the time. So this is another... Um, uh, another historical site. 
So this is, the, uh, you know, right at the top is a cave where the prophet and his uh, companion, they sought refuge while they were being pursued by, uh, by the people from Makkah who did not want him to migrate to Medina. So it is another uh, holy, uh, historical site. About three kilometers away from downtown Makkah. All right. So part of the belief is that our prophet, during his, before he uh, got the revelation, he would um, walk up about three, three or four kilometers away from the city, city center and uh, up to the cave. You see those little indentations, vertical, up and down at the, uh, the face of the, uh, of the cliff? He would climb up there, and and that's where he would do his meditation, and that's where, for the first time, Gabriel um, approached him with the word of God. So that's also considered, um, uh, you know, an important location. And people, you know, um, I don't have pictures, but there are um, pilgrims who do climb up and um, and spend the day there. As part of their, you know, part, you know not not uh, a part of the actual ritual, but just for their own personal uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, desires. So this is Arafat, where I talked about the Mount of Mercy, which is important. To, you know, that's where Hajj is um, is is completed. And then the uh, right at the top. Uh, is where during the uh, during the Hajj period, this mount is covered with heads. You will not you will not see uh, stones at all. So this was an outdoor banquet that uh, our uh, travel agent had arranged for for the group. Okay. So this is on the outskirts of Mecca, and it is called uh, the Tent City. Uh, where you are supposed to go as part of the rituals when you leave uh, Makkah. This is for the Hajj only. You leave Makkah and then you s you stay in this um, uh, in this uh, place called Mina for about three days to uh, as part of your Hajj ritual. And these are little tents which are, which are now permanent and they use only once uh, once a year for the Hajj. But when I went. Yeah, 40, 45 years ago, we we were living in uh, in tents, but now it is all uh, concrete. So now you have you know before people would walk and buses. Now they have um, an overhead trail a uh, train to transport people from the pilgrims from uh, Makkah to Mina. Another another uh, view of the tent city. Another, you know, uh, hilltop palace. It's, it's just interesting. So this is the. You see the, um, you know, which looks like a car, uh, car park, yes. and those uh, s uh, those uh, sort of columns. That is where we do um, the re part of the Hajj ritual is where you stone the the, the uh, symbolically stone. Satan, where in those locations where he tempted um, Abraham not to sacrifice his son, Ishmael, and his other other uh, going through tunnels, they you know they've uh, carved out roads from from the uh, you know, the hills of the mountains. Oh, these pigeons again. So this is where the pigeons. Stay at night, and then they come to the uh, uh, the courtyard of the mosque. They're all over. Another view of the uh, of the Haram the Kaaba mosque. This is a close up. So this is how close we were. Makama Ibrahim, you see that um, that structure, that the golden structure. There, uh, inside is is footstep of Abraham when he stood up to uh, reconstruct the, uh, uh, the structure 
when he was commanded by God. So that is part of the ritual. You have to, uh, to pray at that spot, special prayers. This is um, this is uh, your yeah, people doing the circumambulation around the cover, and it's counterclockwise. Oh, so uh, I uh, told you about the special water of Zamzam, the holy water. So these are like fountains where you can uh, drink water, and the things that are sort of you're leaning out are um, cups in their plastic holders. And at the bottom, you just um, take out the cup, and uh, it's uh, like a water fountain, but it's with uh, some of water. Another view of the dome. Praying inside. Yeah. This is interesting. This is how they stack the chairs for the uh, seniors. Yeah, so you have uh, all, you're scattered all over the inside of the mosque. They have these uh, the chairs, folding chairs that people can, uh, you know, use to sit if they can't kneel. Okay, I'm to bring their children. Yeah. Oh. I mean, while I was there, it was an infant. In fact, the infant was right next door to me, so I could hear her at night. Yes. Oh, yes. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of countries. The first thing they do after uh, after marriage, young couples, they go for Hajj or for Umrah as part, as part of their uh, the start of their life blessed by God. Yeah. So this is constant construction and expansion. This is another view of a of a mosque. Just, uh, you know, I just found that those arches, uh, you know, out of the blue, very interesting. Yeah, that's why Aisha is there. That was that, the wife. Yes, that was his fa the favorite wife of the Prophet. And we, uh, we are so indebted to her because she was the youngest and she lived the longest with him. So she is the narrator of many, many, many authenticated uh, traditions of the prophet. So we've got, especially for women, consider, considering women issues, so so we, we've got, you know, she's considered the mother of believers. In fact, all of his wives are considered mothers of believers. So that is the end of my presentation.